This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Father, we thank you today for tabernacling with us. Thank you for the tangible manifestation of your presence that we feel in this place. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being so real to us. God, thank you for being good and for sustaining Thank you for working out things in the realm of the spirit that we don't even understand. Thank you for unlocking what's been blocked. Thank you, Lord, for setting healing in motion, for causing things that weren't working right to come into focus right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for moving on us. Thank you for moving in us. Thank you for moving through us. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that even issues that are back at home back at school and back at the workplace and back in the neighborhood that you by your spirit God will begin to move Lord in those areas even now thank you for the power of your word Psalm 107 and verse 20 he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions Lord I thank you for sending the word now for the very thing that was trying to destroy us destroy our health destroy our reputation that was trying working against the law of our minds God we thank you that you destroyed the destroyer thank you father in the name of Jesus for working on things that we didn't even know about seeing things that we couldn't even see nor perceive but you with your all-seeing eye things that you know by your own spirit Lord thank you for seeing that and beginning to move Lord and work in a proactive way thank you for the prayer of prevenience right now that goes ahead of the devil cuts him off heads him off and dismantles his plan that calls it into void in the name of Jesus even now even now thank you for canceling every satanic assignment every demonic ploy of the enemy God every stumbling block every design that caused that was designed to make somebody fall every temptation every work of darkness and evil we thank you God for exposing it and expelling it for exposing it and expelling it for exposing it and expelling it for bringing down stronghold in the name of Jesus for bringing down strongholds in the minds of human beings false belief system false ideologies false things that war against the nature of your kingdom God we cast them down we cast out every work of darkness every demonic spirit every hex every curse every work of witchcraft and voodoo we cancel that in the name of Jesus 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 we plead the blood we plead the blood we plead the blood we declare that the blood covers the blood covers the blood covers the blood heals the blood delivers the blood God says we thank you for the blood of Jesus in this place today Lord may you accomplish everything that you set out to do Lord may you now give us ears to be able to hear your word perceive your truth that it might take root on the inside of us and bear fruit in Jesus name amen 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 in Jesus name hallelujah to the Lamb Hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. Take your seat if you can. Take a look here at Job chapter 5, verse 17 through 19. Notice here the word of the Lord. Happy is the man, and this is not gender specific. Happy is the man or the woman whom God corrects. Did you know that it's a blessing if God corrects you? Because the Lord chastens and chastises those whom he loves. Happy is the person whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he applies the bandage. He injures, but his hand also heals. In six crises, he will deliver you. Even in seven, disaster will not touch you. And we're talking today simply from the subject, the great deliverer, the great deliverer. 
when he says that in six uh, crises, he will deliver you, and in seven, even in seven, that is an idiomatic way of expressing an infinite number of something because if God were going to just only do it for six times or seven times, we would have blown that a long time ago. But his mercy has been everlasting to us, and we are deeply, deeply grateful for who God is and for what he's doing in our midst. It's good to know that the mess-ups of yesterday, of last week, of last year, of the last month, are under the blood. It's amazing that the blood deals with things past, present, and future. Thank God that he doesn't have to get up on the cross all over for us again. And some of you might feel like you're in a dark night, but as Victor Hugo said, even the darkest night will end and the sun will rise. Even the darkest night will end and the sun will rise. Here's what I want you to realize is that there is life beyond what the devil does in your life. I want you to understand that unequivocally, that there is life beyond what the devil does in your life. There's life beyond it. You're going to live through it. You might feel like you're going to die. You may feel like you can't show your face in public anymore, but there is life beyond what the devil has done in your life. I'm telling you, I just came to remind somebody today that there is life beyond your adversities. There, there is life beyond your addiction. There is life beyond your bondages that you've been dealing with. There is life beyond your brokenness. There is life beyond calamity that has happened in your life. There is life beyond confusion that has happened in your life. There's life beyond divorce. God hates divorce, but it happens sometimes. And, and there's life beyond it. There's life beyond disaster. There's life beyond envy. There's life beyond eviction. There's, there's life beyond fear. There's life beyond frustration. There's life beyond guilt. There's life beyond guile, a lying tongue. There's life beyond humiliation. There's life beyond horror. There is life beyond injury. There's life beyond insults. There is life beyond loss. There's life beyond mistakes. There's life beyond misery. There is life beyond sickness. There is life beyond trauma. There's life beyond the last thing the devil did trying to trip you up. There's life beyond it. I hope that you get the message that there is life beyond it, that God has a plan. There's life beyond it. There's life beyond it. I, I like how Job chapter 5 and verse 19 reads in the, in the common English Bible. It says, God will protect you from harm no matter how often trouble may strike. How many of you have had more than one attack of the devil? God will protect you from harm no matter how often trouble may strike. Sometimes you feel like you are being buffeted. To buffet means to give one blow after another. And sometimes you can feel like you're just being buffeted, but God still has you. There's life after that. God will protect you and there will be no, no long-term harm. When he says that it won't harm you, it doesn't mean that it won't hurt you temporarily. But it's, this is, the, this is the, the big picture view. This is the long distance view that God is saying that if you trust me, this thing that, that looks like it's evil right now, that is about to wipe you out, like it has messed you up and you're like, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to save face now? How can I face them after this? God says this thing, if you just hold on, if you take the long view, I'll show you that what you thought was taking you out was really setting you up. He says, just, just hold it. He says, don't judge it as that that's killing you now. It, it, it feels like you're dying now. But it's only so that you can be reborn into the thing and become what God wanted you to become anyway. There are certain old skins that have to die and come off. That, that needed to be shed. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. So when God has you to take a look at something, he'll have you to look back and reflect on the old man uh, that is crucified with Christ. And then to, to inspect where you are, to take inventory of where you are, and then to glance forward toward the future about the new creation that we are in him. And to reimagine what he has done by his own, the power of the new birth of Jesus Christ that comes into our life. And so uh, it, it is to remind us that, that no evil shall 
ultimately befall you. So don't, don't ever think that when it says that no harm shall come and then some people will go through something and they say, well, I was harmed, but you, it's not finished. It's not finished. Don't judge God too quickly. He's not finished. Listen, I told you God never ends on a negative. He never ends on a negative. All is well in the end, and if all is not well, it's not the end. So God is working on something. God is working on something. And so I encourage you, refuse to die in a place where you are destined to be delivered. Refuse to die in a place where you're destined to be delivered. And you ought to just say, like, I I can't die here. It, It can't end this way. This is not what I saw in the vision. This is not how I saw it. This is not what I have imagined. This is not what God has has for me. This is why the Apostle Paul said that I I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He intended not to stop midway, but that he was going to finish whatever God had started in him. And so you have to realize that you're on a course here. You're on a course the greatest lessons of life are not learned in a course. I don't care how, what university you went to or didn't go to. The greatest lessons of life are not learned in a course. They are learned on a course. It's a course of life, and that's why Paul said, I have finished my course. Oh, you thought that when you got your degree that you were finished. You got a whole nother degree when you have a child. You get a whole nother degree when you get married. You get a whole nother degree when you get out to get out on the workforce and make money to be able to pay bills. That's a whole nother. Some of you have been to what, the, the, the name of your university? The University of Hard Knocks. I mean, you, I mean, you got a, a graduate degree in it. But as Paul said, I finished my course. But here's what I want to caution you about. There's a course that you're on. There's a course that I'm on. I can only finish my segment of the course. But the truth, the big picture, is that I'm in a relay race. And I cannot measure how the race is going to wind up in the end because I got to pass the baton to another runner and that runner has got to pass it to another runner. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So I cannot say that I have finished my course because I can't win the race unless my grandson wins the race. But if I fail to pass, I lose and they lose. So there's something that you carry that then must be passed on. I've run my segment of it. I've finished my course, but the race is not over. I fought a good fight. I finished my course, the segment that I was assigned to run, but somebody's coming behind me. And I need to have something to put into their hands. And they've got to be willing to run behind me with nothing in their hands, just running behind me so that they are in position. Because when you get a nasty attitude, that puts you out of position. When you're disrespectful, that puts you out of position. When you are unthankful, that puts you out of position. If you are ever going to be able to to, to give it, it's because you have run it. And when you really understand something about how a baton is passed, it is never passed backward, it's always passed forward. That means that the person that was running behind you with nothing in their hand, has to be able to come up on your level and run with you. And then they've got to get a little bit ahead of you and then you hand it off. This is why Jesus said unto John, he he said, he must increase and then I must decrease. John chapter three and verse 30, he must increase and then I can decrease. When they then come up to a certain level, I can't give them this until they come up. If you give it to them before they come up, it's irresponsible that you're putting too much in the hands of somebody who doesn't know how to handle the blessing. And my God, you got to come up, come up, come up, and then overtake me a little bit, and then I pass it forward. The baton is always passed forward. And so if we want them to win, I got to pass it off right. 
and they got to pass it off right. And how well I do is determined by how well my son passes it to his son. And that's the litmus test for finishing well. I cannot finish well if I don't pass well. And so he's, he's bringing something to us to say, listen, I know you're tired and your legs are getting weary, but you're going to run, run the race, but you won't have to cross the finish line. You'll cross it through somebody else. My God, and I don't know whether you're realizing it or not, but some of you are right now doing and accomplishing things that your grandparents never did and never could, but they did it through you. If you got your degree through school, they might have had a third grade education, but if you finish, are you listening to me today? We've got one of our ladies who's here. When she got her PhD, she said, this belongs to my daddy. And she went and hung it in his house. And it's in his house that his, her PhD was in it. She, this is yours, daddy. Daddy didn't have a college degree, but his daughter had a PhD, earned. She said, this is your degree, daddy. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about, that you got to catch something and do something well. And what you do today, you are not doing it in your own strength. You're running the way that you are now because somebody has already run to give you an advantage. They've already suffered. They've already bled. They've already prayed. They've already given up stuff. They've already sacrificed. You better realize it right now that if you go into school, somebody had to scrape together some nickels to be able to pay for something that you had. I'm just here to remind you today that this thing didn't start with you and it's not going to finish with you, but you need to run your part well and pass what God intends for you to pass. And I've often asked myself, what is it that causes human suffering and disillusionment in life? I realize that it's when negative things start happening to us and then we start feeling like we're suffering. And then if the devil can't get us, he then goes after what we love. If he can't stop you, when he couldn't fully stop Adam and Eve, he went after Cain and Abel. So he's coming after your children. He's coming after whatever you love. If he can't get to you, because see, there are people that'll let, they'll let you do things to you because they said, you know, like, I, I, I can handle it. But you put your hands on my child, you're going to die. <laughs> oh, you don't, you, don't, you don't mess with people's children. You don't mess with their children. And so the enemy loves to go after whatever that we, we love. But here's a key that I want to give you that can help you to counter the devil when he becomes, uh, when he sets out an attack against your children. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Notice this. I love it in the, in the, trash, uh, the, the, uh, the Passion Translation. It says, dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go and the values that they've learned from you will be with them for life. And you read King James Version says, train up a child in the ways he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from them. But it says, dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go. Many of the Jewish scholars actually say, according to their natural bend, their natural talents, point them in that direction and they will not depart from it. But it's setting those values in their life and they will not depart. Those values will be with them all of the days of their life that are set in them. There are things that people in this room right now know because of values that, that a great grandparent put in them, that a grandparent put in them, that a parent put in them. And they may not have fully understood it at the time, but I bet you they understand it now. Because it's pointing them in the right direction. And then those things will always be in their life. And I, I, I say this to you with all gravity in the spirit of Jesus Christ. It is not sufficient for you to just raise your children in church. You must raise them in Christ. This is why the Bible says, let that mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. It is the mindset of Christ. What would Jesus think? What would, he, what would he do in this situation? It's putting, giving them a biblical worldview so that they understand how to think biblically in every situation that they are faced in life. How would Jesus conduct himself if he was sitting in this classroom? How would he uh, you know, conduct himself if he were on this job, if he were the manager, if he were in charge? What would he do? 
How would he influence people? How would he leverage what, what uh, they have given him for the, the, the sake of goodness and, and, and a God calls in the earth? So it's not enough to just be raised in church. They got to be raised in Christ and Christ in them, the hope of glory. Let the mind that was in Christ Jesus be also in them as a value. And see, if you couple that with dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go and the values then, he says, that they have learned will be with them for life. Put it in them while they're young and it will be with them for life. Now, whenever your life, whenever you are disillusioned or, or off course, here's what you need. You need direction. What does direction ask? Direction asks the question, which way should I be moving? Which way should I be moving? Direction, which way should I be moving? God's a moving thing. You, gotta, you, you can't sit there. You can never get stuck unless you stop. Ask the question with direction, which way should I be moving? When you don't know which way to move, you get paralyzed. If you don't know where you're going in life, any road will take you there. But you become overwhelmed with too many choices. When I was growing up, we didn't have 500 television stations and countless internet channels. We had three major channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC. We didn't know what to do when, when Channel 17 came on. And Channel 46, I mean, when, my, my goodness, I mean... The, but I tell you this, we didn't have to scratch our heads for 50 minutes trying to figure out what we wanted to watch. Less is more. I'm convinced of that. Less is more. We didn't have to try to figure out direction. So, but direction asks the question, which direction should I be moving? Which direction should I be moving? And just remember this principle, that distraction is the enemy of direction. Distraction is the enemy of direction. So if the devil really wants to get you, all he has to do is to distract you. Then you lose your sense of direction. Distraction. If he breaks your focus and he gives you digital distraction where something is always buzzing and something is always sending you a notification and something is always clamoring for your attention, it is distraction that is the enemy of direction. No wonder! We have so many confused people because they've been so distracted and they do not understand the direction that they should be moving. So direction is the first thing. Which direction should I be moving in? What direction should I be moving in? If you're, if you're in a funk, if you're, if you're in a place where you don't know what to do and you, you, you just feel in a malaise about you, ask the direction question, what Direction should I be moving? Which way should I be going? Because distraction is the enemy of direction. The second thing is alignment. How do I align my values and principles uh, my, with my beliefs, with the kingdom of God, with the word of God? Am I aligned? Because things will only flow where there is alignment. If we're not aligned to his kingdom, it is the same as having watching an old movie and, and the audio is not in sync with the video. And the mouths are moving, but the sound is not moving with it. And it's just aggravating to watch that happen. The world calls that hypocrisy. If your audio doesn't match your video, because they say you're talking a good game, but you can't, when I look at what, they're not in alignment. It, it, one needs to lay over at the other because you're one way in the church and you're another way at home and oh. it's alignment it's it's alignment where your audio and your video are in alignment that's where power flows Jesus said I do what I see my father do I'm in I'm in alignment with him he said without him I can do nothing he said, I'm, I'm in alignment with him. You need direction, you need alignment. The third thing is that you need commitment or discipline. Because there are people, you can know your direction, you can come into an alignment, but without commitment or discipline, you can't stay, stay the course. Commitment or discipline is what helps you stay the course. Here's the question with commitment or discipline. You ask this question, am I willing to pay the price? 
Am I willing to pay the price? There's a price. There's a price for this. If you're going to have a good marriage, there's a price for it. If you're going to have a good business, there's a price for it. If you're going to do well in school, there is a price. There's a price for it. Are you willing to pay the price for what I want? Are you willing to pay the price? A significant cause of suffering or disillusionment is ignoring what you know is right. You start suffering, it's because you're ignoring what what you know is right. You become disillusioned, you're ignoring what you know is right. Here's, Here's what the word of the Lord says, Proverbs chapter 28 verse 4 in the Passion Translation. Here's what it says, those who turn their backs on what they know is right will no longer be able to tell right from wrong. But those who love the truth strengthen their souls. If you don't love truth, you weaken your soul. But notice this, those who turn their backs on what they know is right will no longer be able to tell right from wrong. No wonder there's so much confusion in our culture. You know way down on the inside of you. The foolishness that that we've come with today and that we are confronted with that doesn't even have common sense with it. You know, you, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, nobody has to really write a book about it. I mean, you know, just be honest with yourself. Go home and look in the mirror. Look yourself in the mirror in the eyes and check to see what happens on the inside. But those who turn their back on what they know is right will no longer be able to tell right from wrong. Here's another thing. Offenses cause suffering. Offenses cause suffering. But I want you to understand this, offenses are normal to life. You cannot avoid being offended and you can't avoid offending somebody else. That's why you'll have to be able to forgive one another. Now listen, one of the reasons that the Bible brings us into a community of people because you cannot be developed in everything that you need to be developed in as a Christian in a silo. It's not until you're in relationship with another human being that you have to practice forgiveness and your own repentance. You forgive as you have been forgiven. It means that people are going to offend you. They're going to step on your toes. They're going to do something. And you know, some people are really, really temperamental. It's like, oh, girl, I don't know, I don't know what kind of mood he's in today. You're like, man, I, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to let you know whether me and my wife going to be able to go or not, man, you know, because, uh, you know, she, she was, yeah, I don't know how she's going to be feeling. <laughs> and you're just scared, because you, know, you that, and, and you try to do everything right. And you can try to do everything right, and you can do 999 good things. And that one thing, it's like you were supposed to call me at 137, and I was standing out there waiting, and you... You got there at 142, and I told you. And one little area of offense now blows up into this whole thing. And you don't even understand, you were trying to walk so carefully. You were trying to dot every I, cross every T, and they still got offended. Because some people are gonna find offense In everything that you do, you slave and cook a meal and then they wonder why this is cold. Or this has too much salt and this is, and you just can't please them. No matter what you do, they always find something wrong. People will be offended and it's normal to life. So expect it so that you don't stress yourself out over it. Jesus taught us that. Luke chapter 17, verse one, look what Jesus said. Then he, Jesus, said to his disciples, Jesus said, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. There's going to be some trouble. They're going to have some knucklehead employees. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen that you're trying to build a dream team. I know. But somebody is not going to follow the script. Somebody's going to drag in late and not carry their share of the weight. Offenses will come, but whoa, whoa, whoa. Through the one whom they come through. There will be consequences. Oh, there will be consequences, but offenses will come. So it's normal to life. You're not trying to offend them. 
They get offended. You will do things that will hurt your children. Sometimes your children will be grown and then they'll tell you, well, mama, you know, I, you know, one time I came to you with something and you just told me to shut up because you were on the phone. <laughs> and that child is all bent out of shape over something. You didn't even, you didn't even know that they, you were just on the phone and it's like, just wait a minute. But now they are all into their feelings over some obscure thing that you don't even have memory of and it scarred them. And you don't even remember, and you're apologizing for something that you don't even remember. Offenses must come. Jesus taught us that. But woe be the one through whom they come. There will be things that are going to happen in your life that will offend you, but you have to let it go. You, have, you can choose not to retain offense. You can choose not to. Now, notice what Psalm 119 verse 165 says. Great peace have they which love thy law. The thing that is the antidote to offense is peace. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall offend them. Now the word offend here actually means nothing will cause them to stumble and fall. They that, have, that love the law, that love God's law, Nothing will cause them to stumble and utterly fall. Utterly fall. Nothing. And see, notice uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26 and 27. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Whenever anger controls you, anger, then put the devil's initial in front of it, D, and it becomes danger. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Anger gives the devil a place in your life. When you start brewing and stewing with anger, you give place to the devil. So the Bible says neither give place to the devil. Being angry is not a sin. I want you to hear that carefully. Being angry is not a sin. But not dealing with that anger will then turn into sin. Anger is emotion. If you don't control anger, anger will turn into wrath. Wrath is the expression of anger. Because you got angry, you slap. Wrath is an action. Anger is an emotion. But if you don't tame the emotion, the action will follow. So, when offense comes, when anger comes, when offense comes, all that Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26 and 27 is telling you, when anger comes, here's the Bronner version, give it a deadline. Put a deadline on it. Be angry for five minutes. Say what you need to say for five minutes and then turn it on. I mean, you're, you're going to injure them after that. I mean, you know, just for five minutes, unload. Say what you want to say, what you need to say to get it off your chest for five minutes. Uh, for some people, it, it may be for, for five hours. But less is more. Remember, please remember that. Less is, less is more. Here's, see, this is the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, don't take that into the next day. Deal with it before night falls. Don't let the sun go down. Put a time limit on your anger. So be angry. I meant feel it. Say what you need to say. Talk to Jesus about it. Journal. Get in this shower and cry. Take a long bath and soak, whatever. Go for a walk. Work out in the gym. However you deal with it, just do all of that. Talk to Jesus about it and then let it go. Because it's like eating rat po poison and then waiting on the rat to die. But you ate it. So feel the pain, feel the hurt, cry, fuss, do what you need to do. Put a time limit on it though, a time limit. I'm like, when they, they've been out all night and the next morning, five minutes, just turn the faucet on. <laughs> Express it out so you don't explode, just let it, five minutes, five minutes. You got a five minute limitation there. Say what you need to say. After that five minutes, Take some deep breaths, look to Jesus and say, Lord, I let it go. I let it go because it's going to start consuming you if you don't. 
And then it will lead, it, it'll lead to sin. And here's why it says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, on that anger. Don't let the sun go down on it, because if the sun goes down on it, what's going to happen is that you're going to give place to the devil. And it's like a staph infection. Staph infection. It's an inside job that'll begin to destroy the, the, the organization. It's a staph infection. It festers in the dark. There's some sneaky stuff going on. The infection festers in an unseen place, but it will eventually manifest in gangrene. So that's why you have to deal with it. If you give place to the devil, an infection is going to start festering. That's why you have to deal with it. So this is the, the betadine wash that you're doing so that you stop the infection that happens. You, you, you forget, have a, have, have, go ahead and have your hissy fit. Say what you need to say and then just say, I'll, I'll let this go. But I got five minutes because I don't want to carry this in the next day because there are only two directions that you can grow. You either grow together or you grow a, apart. And if you go to bed angry, the next thing you know, you will have gone three days and not spoken to each other. And I've seen husband and wife do that. I mean, they just, you know, him man looking for his key. It's on the table. <laughs> it's just the essential information, but it comes out with such attitude that it's like slicing you with a razor blade every time they walk by. When they look at you, you know, you can feel the tension in the room. And so you're giving place to the devil. And if they, you send them out, if they, be like, if they meet up somebody, see, he's got an agent just waiting on them. Hey, Johnny, hey. And he knows what he just left. See, don't, you give no place to the devil. That's what he's saying. That's why he says, don't, don't let that, don't, don't go to bed without having de dealt with that. Deal with that. Put a time limit on your anger. Put a time limit on your anger. Express it, get it out, and let it go. But handling offense requires discipline, and discipline is not easy. I'm just trying to be real with you. Notice what Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 says. No discipline, no discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It is painful. You see that? No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. You, you, you get in paddle. It is not enjoyable. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. If you don't give a consequent to wrong behavior, you have incentivized wrong behavior. And what you're trying to do is create a deterrent toward wrong behavior. That's what discipline is about. Discipline is not done in anger. It is done in love. Discipline is correction in love. It is correcting the child. It's saying, I'm doing this because I love you. And I don't want you to destroy yourself. And I don't want what looks cute right now to by the time you're 12 years old to look, start looking like a rebellious teenager to me. So it's, I'm dealing with this now. You may not understand why I'm doing this now, but come here, come here, come here baby girl. Come here, baby boy. Because I need to set this straight now so that we don't deal with this later. And I'm doing this not because I hate you, but I'm doing this because I... I love you. That's what they were saying when they, were, they used to say, this is going to hurt me <laughs> more than it's going to. And see, that's like talking in riddles because you don't understand that when they got switches that they done platted and wearing your behind out and talking about, this is going to hurt me. <laughs> I don't know where we got the idea as Christians that once we got saved that we would live happily ever after and there would be no problems. Here's the truth of the matter. Sometimes the moment that you get saved, all hell breaks loose. And here's what the Bible says, Psalm 34, 19, the righteous person faces many trouble. Now, now I know that you probably thought that they, that was a misprint that the demonic person, the troublemaker, no, 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 the righteous person faces many trouble, but notice the promise, 
but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. See, he's a deliverer. He's a deliverer. It didn't say that you wouldn't go through trouble. It means that every time you get in trouble, God's going to come and rescue his baby. That, that's what you did, you know, you know. You know, back during the day, I mean, when all of my hair was black, some people said that I looked like Ray Parker Jr. <laughs> but you remember that they would say that I ain't afraid of no ghost. Who you going to call? <laughs> Ghostbusters. So it, it, it's, it's, it's one of those kind of thing. You're going to have a little trouble every now and then. And God is like, I'm coming to your rescue when ghosts, evil spirits, come and start trying to haunt your life and stir up feelings and emotion. Who you going to call? You better call the Holy Ghost somebody. You better plead the blood. I'm just telling you, you know, when you start dealing with some stuff, I'm telling you, but see, the righteous person faces many trouble, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. He's coming. And, and, and notice, I know you might have said, well, that's Old Testament, but let me give you a New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Notice what it says. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured, Paul is saying. He says, you know about all how I was persecuted in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. He says, but the Lord rescued me from all of it. And notice what he says in verse 12. And yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Everybody who's going to be saved, you're going to suffer. You will suffer. You will suffer. I know that doesn't sound fun. But God says it's going to work for your good. He said, I'm a deliverer. I'm a deliverer. And I just came to remind you that God still loves you even while you may suffer. And this is what I'm, I'm saying, that in the midst of your suffering, here's what you do, how you get through it. When you can't fix the situation, fix your focus. When you cannot fix the situation, Fix your focus because here, if you focus on the hurt, you will continue to suffer. But if you focus on the lesson, you will continue to grow. I want you to see that. If you focus on the hurt, you will continue to suffer. But if you focus on the lesson, you will continue to grow. So while you're suffering, you've got to be able to discover and reflect on your hope. The only way that you can get through a bad situation is, is to have the hope. You know, like if somebody comes to stay with you and they overstay their time and they start doing things that really get on your nerves, you just, you, what you have to do is then start counting down with, you know, three more days. <laughs> then you wake up the next day, two more days. <laughs> you know, just start counting yourself down. You know, I, I've known people, I mean, I used to, uh, when I was counseling couples when they were first getting married and they didn't have the resources to get their own place and they had to go and live with mom and them. And I, 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 t I told them, who's ever mom and them they were going to live with, I said, put a deadline on it. Put a deadline on it. I said, you don't, don't go in there with an, uh, an open end because you lose your hope then. <laughs> I said, go in and say, you know, I need six months to be able to get on my feet. Six months. Give me six months. So that when you get tired of each other, it's like, you know, five more months and three days. <laughs> I mean, you, you need to be able to count, count it down, you know, four more months and 28 days. Count, start counting. That gives you hope. You always, if you're, if you're suffering, if, if, if I just know, if, if I know, if, it get a, if you get a prison sentence, start counting, counting down until your day of release. You have to have a, a hope strategy, a blessed hope. I love something that uh, Tim Keller said. He said that we are living we need a living hope to get through life and endure suffering. A living hope. And a living hope enables us to have both sorrow and joy. Our living hope is an inheritance achieved for us by Christ. Because he's promised to come to our rescue, to deliver us. And I want you to notice, as I, as I said, you can't always understand what God is doing, but he said that this thing will not cause you to stumble and utterly fall. He says it's going to really work for your good. That's why he says this thing cannot harm you in the long run. That's why people like Maya Angelou said, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey. Like I've been through a lot of unpleasant things. She'd been raped. She'd been abused. She'd gone through such trauma in her life that she lost her voice and could not speak for years. The trauma of it. But when she did speak, there was a richness and a gravitas to her words that you could not get. It is not until you have been locked up in silence and ignored on the backside of the mountain 
that there is such a resilience and a strength and a maturity and a compassion and a humility and a love that will build in your heart that if you got it too fast, too quick, you would have been an arrogant little something. But God worked the situation out in such a way that you were humble in this process because it broke you down and you realize this is not me. This is the hand of the Lord that has rescued me and come and picked me up and empowered me to be able to stand. And so that's why he said in Psalm chapter 4 and verse 1, you notice what the word of the Lord, he says, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness, because thou hast enlarged me. Lord, you enlarged me. You stretched me. You made me bigger. When? When I was in distress. When I was stressed out. When I was under pressure and was caving in and it was too much on me. You enlarged me. You gave me bigger ideas. You didn't take away my, my problem. You enlarge me because here's the problem here. The problem is a level seven. You're down here at a level five. So God says, I'm going to enlarge you. I'm not going to change your problem. I'm going to change you. So you go from a five. You walk with God. Now you come up to six. Then you come up to seven. Then you come up to eight. And now what was too big for you is now not a problem because you're bigger than that. As you grow, now you can handle more weight. Now you can handle more stress. He enlarged your muscles. That's why when you go under the stress in the gym, you break down the muscles, but it's only breaking down so it can build up bigger and better to meet the challenge of the demand. You might start off with 25 pounds, but the next thing you know, you're doing 30 and then 35 and then 40. Now you got 25 on each side. And now you can pick that thing up and do it, not because the weight has changed, but because you've changed to be able to handle double what used to stress you. I'm just here to tell you that God is trying to enlarge you. He's not trying to acquiesce and bring you down to this tiny little level because when the Holy Ghost really gets a hold of you, God will put a vision on the inside of you that is bigger than what you can handle. God will give you something that you have to grow into. Who am I talking to in this place? You have to grow into what God wants. And either you grow up and say, God, I can take the pressure now because I've grown, or you got to diminish your vision to the size of the weight that you're willing to tolerate or increase your tolerance for pain. You got to go there until your muscles are shaking and burning, but God is building you to be able to carry something bigger and heavier than you could do in your own strength and might. And you'll look back and say, Lord, you enlarged me when I was in distress and nobody else came to my rescue. God said, I wanted to be your superman. I was coming into your place of brokenness and stress in your life. I hope it makes sense to you. I love something that Seneca said. He said, no man is more unhappy than he who never faces adversity, for he is not permitted to prove himself. You need to go through something that allows you to prove yourself because other people will swear that it was somebody that gave you something. They'll swear that it was a natural endowment for you. They want to strip away all of your tenacity and they don't know what your brokenness that you've had to press your way and the pain that you've gone through and the disappointment and the people that walked away from you and the people that stole from you and took money from you that never paid it back that said that they were going to pay it back and the folks that said that they were going to help you and then they got into that place and they never came back to help you and then you were all in this by yourself and now you've been enlarged. God made you bigger than anything that you have dealt with because di difficulty wakes up the genius in us. There's a genius on the inside of you, but it'll never be awakened until you go through difficulty. Never be awakened until you go through difficulty. And I'm amazed at what God is able to do in us and through us because it's a dark, cold world out there. And when you're walking as a child of God, God knows that there are things that are out here in this world, and so he, he wants to prepare the world, and so he's not going to just change the whole world just for you, but he'll change you for the world, and then use you to change the world. And so while you're going through and you're shaking, because it's a cold world, 
and people do mean and low down things to you? Isaiah 61 and verse 10 talks about that when you praise God, when you worship Him, it's a covering for you. You get a garment of praise. See, the garment actually is a coat. It's cold. God doesn't make the world hot when it's wintertime, but He gives you a garment. And the way that you insulate yourself from the cold is to slip into a praise. It is to slip into worship. And somehow, God encapsulates you in that worship. It puts you in a bubble that desensitizes you to the cold. The world is still cold, but he changed you to be able to deal with a cold world. It's a coat of praise. And so when you get discouraged, put on the garment of praise. Slip into it. It makes the cold, austere world become a place of warmth because God didn't change that. He changed you for it and then sends you out into that world. I want you to notice what Psalm 117 verse 71 says. He says, my suffering was good for me for it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. Some of you are on your way to hell. God calls you to suffer. God, it's, it's God that inflicts wounds and then takes his hand and heals. Sometimes he has to break our backs because we get too cocky. But he says, my suffering, that's when you know that the person has matured. When you begin to say, my suffering, the stuff that I went through, it was good for me. Because it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. Lord, it taught me to pay attention to your law. I have to, ha I have to bust my head open. Because it taught me, Lord. I have to run into a dead end. Because it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. You didn't understand what God was doing, but God was wrecking your world so that you would turn to him. He had to break you so that you would know him as a healer. My suffering was good for me. I'm telling you, it won't harm you. It'll work out for your good. It'll feel like it's killing you in the moment because God will break your leg just to keep you from running from him. So you can bring you close to his heart. So you'll learn who he is. And you'll be able to walk with him and talk with him and God brings you into an incredible place. And that's why... I, it's at that point that when you understand that God is a deliverer. He couldn't be a deliverer if you didn't go through things that were unpleasant. And that's why he reminds us in Romans 8, 28, and we know, not we think, not we hope, but and we know that all things work together for the good. Good is working for your good of those that love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. When he says, all things, it's not just all good things and sweet things and good smelling things, the good things and the bad things. It's the positives and the negatives. It's the ups and the downs. It's in sickness and in health. It's in riches and in poverty. All things, when they cast you out and then when they bring you in, all things, when they accept you and when they reject you, all things will work together for your good. You didn't even understand why you got rejected because re re rejection is just redirection. And if you'll just trust him, if you'll trust him, if you'll trust him, we know all things, all things work together for our good. All things work together for our good and this is what you're going to find. I would want you to hear this prophetically. That God is going to put you back together in front of the very people that broke you. He said, I will prepare a table in the presence of your enemies. I'm going to bless you where they can see it. I want them, to, the, the very ones that told you, if you leave me, you, you, you're going to be nothing. You're not going to make it. You need me. God will show I am the deliverer. I'll move you. You are you're, you're a dispensable thing. God is the one who is indispensable. And they thought that if they walked out of your life that you would collapse, that your life would implode, that you would be a mess. But God said, no, 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 no. No, I'm the rescuer. I am the one. I'll put them back together and I will empower them to be able to stand in the midst of things and they won't even understand how you're able to hold all, everything together uh, after all of the pressure of what you've done with at such a young age. How in the world, how did you raise two children and, and, and put them through school all by yourself and you didn't get child support? How? How? How did this happen? How could this be? They thought that it would break you.
but God is your deliverer. And he is the one that is calling us. He said, trust me, trust me, trust me, because God's working on something. I mean, at the very time when you start seeing other people that started out when you did, and now they're way ahead of you, and you're like, God, what's up? What's up with this? God's got a plan. He's working on something. And let me just remind you, you can only get stuck if you stop. Refuse to stop. You can only get stuck if you stop. Don't let life slam you so hard that you're stunned and you cannot move or that you become paralyzed with fear that you cannot move. It is the roar of the lion. I'm a Leo. It's the roar of the lion that paralyzes its prey with fear. And oftentimes when the lion opens his mouth and roar, it can be heard for up to five miles away. And when they hear the roaring of the lion, it paralyzes them with fear. That's why God had to tell us in his word 366 times, fear not, fear not, fear not. Because God says, I'm going to give you something that's going to intimidate you. I'm going to put an opportunity in your hand that's going to be bigger than what you can lift with the strength that you have currently. But God says, I'm not concerned about your comfort. I'm concerned about your development. And I'm going to be like a coach who's saying, give me five more. Push until you're shaking because I'm breaking down that weakness and I'm replacing it with strength. It is not, strength is not built until weakness is exposed. Strength is not built until weakness is exposed. Strength is not built until weakness is exposed. God's working on something. And I just came to tell you today, I just stopped by to tell you that God is a deliverer and that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to finish it. Now let me say this to you. There are certain things that you'll never understand until you get to a certain place with God. Some of you have never been able to experience the fullness of God because you've never gotten all the way in. Some of you may be old enough to remember the old telephone booths. I remember walking down the street one day. The man had, you know, they had a big phone book on the inside of them connected by a metal cord so you couldn't run off with it. And it was dust, the sun was going down, and he was standing in the door of the phone booth trying to pull the the book as far as he could so he could see the number that he was looking up. And I walked by and simply said to him, sir, if you'll step all of the way in and close the door, a light will come on. And that's what happened if any man be in Christ. The moment that you get in him and shut the door of every demonic opportunity, a light, a light will come on. A light will come on. A light. Get all the way in. Shut the door. Some of you have been leaving it cracked because you like some stuff out there. You've been leaving it cracked. Shut the door. A light will come on. Arise and shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. If you're ready to come all the way in now, I want you to meet me here at the altar. Because a light will come on. A light will come on. I want to invite you. Come on. Some of you are going through hell. You've gone through hell and high water. And he's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you. He's saying, come on, come on, come on. You've been broken. You've been in pain. But it's not going to end. I'm just telling you. God never ends on a negative. All is well in the end. And if all is not well, it's not the end. Come on. Come on. You're saying, Jesus, I I, want to get all the way in this time all the way. I want to go all the way with you this time. 
I'm tired of my backsliding ways. I want to go all the way. I want to get all the way in. I want to shut the door so that the light comes on. I want to walk in the, in the light of the revelation that you give me, Lord. I want to walk. I so commend you for your decision today. still coming. He's going to work things for your good. They're still coming. God has incredible plans for your life to be able to take you places beyond your wildest imagination. As your life is submitted into the hands of God, you will absolutely be blown away by what God can and will do in and through you. My natural personality is a shy person. I'm an introvert by nature. What I'm doing now, I'm out of my comfort zone. It is a work of God in my life. And I've been all over the world and spoken before some incredible crowds and fear never fills my heart because of the mantle and the call of God that's on my life. But that's not who I am personally. I'm a shy guy, minding my own business, cherishing my own privacy. But when you become an instrument in the hand of God, God will snatch you out of your comfort zone because nothing grows in the comfort zone. Nothing. You only grow when you come out of the comfort zone. 
And I see some folks that's before me right now. And I see a picture of arrows that God will sharpen you like an arrow. Sharpening is a painful experience because some of your flesh has to be removed. But it allows you to become a tool and more specifically a weapon in the hand of God that he will send into the enemy's camp, territory and plunder and bring out. So once God delivers us, then he uses us to deliver others. It's the way that God works. Stretch your hand toward these folks. Father, in the name, Shakrabasulotophus, the name that is above every name, the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. We implore you, Lord Jesus, you see this harvest of souls that you've drawn by your own power and by your own spirit today. Lord, I pray that you will use them, sharpen them, and then release them into divine purpose, divine purpose, divine purpose. I pray, God, that the things that you will speak to their hearts and their minds, that you will give them divine retention, divine retention, divine retention, that it'll hold, that it'll stick, that they'll be sealed. Thank you, God, today, because there's been an enemy assignment against them, and you've canceled that assignment. You have rescued them out of the hand of the enemy. And this day, Lord, now, we open ourselves totally to you. We come all of the way in. And we say, Lord, use us for your glory. Take our hearts, our minds, our bodies. Use them for your glory. Cause us after this day, Lord, that we will never, ever be the same. Transform us from the crown of our heads to the soles of our feet. Make us into a brand new person, usable for your kingdom. And for your good, for your glory, to bless our lives, oh God, but ultimately for your glory, transform them. In Jesus' name, amen. We wanna take you to a place of further prayer. If you will turn and go to my left and to your right, we've got some literature that we want to put into your hands before you leave today. Will you clap your hands and thank God so much for these folks? My God, my God, my God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet, everybody. Please remember tonight at 6 o'clock p.m., we're having a prayer and prophecy and worship time together at 6 p.m. right here in the cathedral this evening going to be an incredible time every time that we make time for God he's never failed to show up to come in our midst I'm excited about where we are and what God is doing this is a new day I'm telling you he saves us and redeems us and delivers us for his purpose he's the God who has delivered who does deliver and yet shall deliver and his delivering power and glory is working on your behalf And you're going to be able to look back and say, Lord, I thank you for everything that I went through. It didn't feel good at the time, but now I understand what you were doing. I understand you made me better. You made me stronger. You made me wiser. You you helped me find my place of anointing and purpose. It was out of my brokenness that I actually found my power to heal. In your name, Jesus. I'm telling you, God's got his hands on you in an incredible way. Father, in the name of Jesus. You see this body of believers, but you use them for your glory. Father, I pray in the, as you move us through the vicissitudes of life, that as we take a rear view, that you'll cause things that we went through that we didn't understand, you'll cause it to all of a sudden make sense. Oh, yeah. And we'll see how you were taking the bitter and the sweet and mixing it all together and making something that was stimulating and exhilarating to our palate that we could not understand at the time because the ingredients came separated and nothing seemed good at the time. But in retrospect, we thank you, God, for taking the bitterness of the vanilla extract 
the blandness of the butter, the dryness of the flour, and yet mixing it all together with eggs and milk and making something that is absolutely tantalizing to our taste buds. And you make us the meal and then serve us to hungry people. And you ask us the question, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Father, I thank you that you make us bread to be able to be a feeder of your people because we know you and we love you. Now open our eyes this week to see your hand moving through various areas of our life for your glory. May we see your hand working good, hiding blessings throughout each day for us. May you give us a sensitivity to your spirit to see the blessings that you hide in each day for us. May we recognize it. Give us eyes to perceive your hand working in us, for us, and through us to ultimately bring glory to your name. May your blessings rest upon this people as we leave this place, but never from your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need we hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.